And to discuss the elections further, we sat down with former Congressman Dave Bratt, who previously represented Virginia's 7th District and is now Dean of the Business School at Liberty University. Here's part of our conversation. Congressman Dave Bratt, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Congressman, you've obviously run a uh, successful campaign in the past. Um, give us a glimpse of what it looks like in the final week leading up to the election. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you're kind, but I had both experiences, right? So I felt the last couple weeks uh, firm up. Uh, when I came in, a, a huge wave was in the works uh, in my direction. Uh, and then within four years, uh, the country had, had done a reversal in many ways, and I felt a wave come against me. And it kind of firmed up in the direction it was heading, but really firmed up in the last couple weeks. And so right now, I, I think there's huge uh, headwinds helping the, the Republican side. Uh, and I think uh, I, I've heard of some polling, for example, up in Connecticut and New Hampshire, people that uh, races that have never been polled before because they're, they're out by 10 or 15 percent, uh, with the Republican being in, in the lead, uh, just out of the box kind of stuff. And so if, if that is the case, if there's one of those anomalies, the question is, are there more? And uh, we won't know until the data roll in, but that, that's the, the tendency I've been, I've been seeing and hearing about. And to that point, uh, Larry Summers recently uh, came out and said, when you see inflation at what we're seeing the rate at now, 8%, yeah. it takes years. I think he said something six to eight years yeah. for things to change. What's yeah. your take? Yeah, no, I think he's right. He's, he's quoting a Deutsche Bank study that uh, was posted last week. And uh, once the data show very clearly that uh, they have the, the 70s, kind of in 50, 50 months prior and 50 months ahead, and once you crack the 8% uh, inflation level, uh, the evidence states you're at you're going to have five to six years above 6%, right? So you don't go the, the right now the orthodoxy is this 8% thing is going to go down to 3% within two years, and so this evidence and these these new papers have come out to show the historical uh, record uh, goes completely against this modern narrative, and the modern narrative also just. To, so folks can remember, everyone said inflation was transitory. So they've been wrong on that, right? And then everyone said there's no recession. And now 100% of economists are saying, and I'm, I'm not making that number up, it's 100 all economists say we're gonna have a recession next year, right? The severity uh, we'll see about. Uh, so the, uh, the blue chips and the forecasters and the Federal Reserve have been wrong, 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 wrong. And so I think it's wise to look at history and the historical data show that once you crack that 8%, which we have, and England and Europe, and right, he's got 23 countries in this study, uh, but we, what we care about is ourselves. So, but once you crack the eight, uh, it might come back down to six, but you're gonna be stuck at six, and that, it's called sticky, sticky prices in economics uh, for five, five or more years. And so that, that's very worrisome. Congressman, I want to get your thoughts when it comes to some of these high-profile races for governor around the country, whether it be in Arizona, Pennsylvania. Um, why do these matter, or how do these matter when it comes to the general election uh, in 2024? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, as I was hinting at before, I, I think there's a major realignment going on. I don't think it's the normal, you know, the blue guys win by two, and then the red guys win by two, and back and forth. Uh, this thing, I think, is much bigger. Uh, the, the left, uh, when I taught college 20, 30 years ago, it, it, was, it was mainly liberals, right? You got JFK in the back of your head, and he did tax cuts, and uh, liberals cared about liberty and crime and the family and all this like Republicans did. There was uh, way more in common. Uh, these days, uh, the liberals are gone, uh, and the left has emerged. And the left is not clear in their articulation of what their party is really up to, right? Because it's not attractive to say we follow a lot of Marxist theory. And Marxist theory in its simplest form is a class struggle through history, right? If you read your basic Marx. And so the left, you can see, right? Uh, now all of the old mainstays of American politics are being chipped away, right? God, country, family. Uh, in Marxism, there can be no God. There can be no competition to the state. And that's not my theory. Go ask the Russians or the Soviets or the Chinese uh, what it looks like living in, under that regime. Uh, family policy, oh, Dave, you're exaggerating there. It can't be, you can't. Uh, go to China and look up the one uh, 
one child uh, policy, right? If you want to talk about messing with family structure, they got a demographic crisis coming on. Uh, some of the heavy duty demographers, Peter Zeehan, for example, says uh, China will not be the nation state it is today in 10 years. It'll be done. That's a, that's a pretty heavy duty forecast. Right, so God, country, uh, family, and then the country, uh, this country is a republic, right, democratic republic, uh, with representative government, et cetera. A Marxism doesn't have anything. Instead, what does Marxism do? It, it drives wedges between blacks and whites and women and men and rich and poor and every bucket you can think of, right? It used to be worker versus the capitalist. Uh, now they're just trying to divide. I think Americans are sick of it. Uh, right, our major cities have been torn apart. Uh, there's drug problems all over the place, and uh, so I, I think there's a major political realignment, uh, and we'll see who can capture uh, that in, in a positive way and construct something positive coming out of this. Former Virginia Congressman Dave Bratt, thank you so much. You bet. Thanks for having me. Voters around the country are considering hot topic issues like the state of the economy and rising crime. At the same time, cultural and social issues are surfacing more and more these days. For instance, abortion and gender transitioning. To dive into some of these social issues and how they'll impact voters this fall, I spoke with Matthew Peterson, founder of network platform, New Founding. Matt Peterson, thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here. Matt, I want to talk to you about the uh, midterms. You have, obviously, the economy, the border. I want to get your thoughts on some of the social issues facing America. You have critical race theory, uh, transgender laws now affecting minors. Um, How big of an impact do you think these will have, the social issues, on the midterm? I think what's interesting is these are the issues that politicians usually like to stay away from. Uh, the traditional you know, establishment wisdom on the right, you talk about bread and butter issues, you don't talk about social issues. Um, it's, uh, it's yucky stuff. Uh, it's not the kind of thing you just want to get mired in. Uh, but I think what we see this time around is a resurgence of those issues in a big way. Uh, the, there's a lot of emotion uh, when it comes to what's going on with kids in schools, especially. That's wrapped in with all these parents who are angry throughout the country about what's being taught. And so that issue was really added to CRT, uh, the fact that you're pushing uh, transgenderism and mutilation of children. Um, you know, that's, that's hot fire. So uh, as much as people don't want it to come back, all these issues are coming back. And obviously, with what happened with abortion, uh, you know, both sides are going to be taking that one to the polls as well. You just touched upon it there, gender-affirming care. A lot of these terms can sometimes be a little bit deceiving. Um, California Governor Newsom just signed a bill that will allow minors to alter these life-altering surgeries. Um, What are parents around the country thinking? I think that parents, at first, they don't want to deal with it. I mean, just to be honest, most parents uh, are in some kind of denial or they're busy, they don't want to deal with it. But increasingly, they're waking up to the fact that this is happening in their schools. A, they're talking to your kids about sexuality at a young age and showing them all kinds of stuff that, uh, you know, 10 years ago we would have thought would have been an abuse. You should lock, you should lock teachers up who do that. They're doing that as, as couched in official language, of course, and the most egregious part of all of it is when they're hiding from parents the fact that uh, these kids are convinced they should transition or chemically or physically castrate themselves. So I do think that this is not an issue that can be avoided anymore, that parents are waking up to it and they're increasingly angry. But the way it breaks out is red state, blue state, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's another reason for people to move to red states. It's another reason for red state leadership to be more bold, whereas you don't really see much real change in, in blue states. So one argument in this debate is that if you have one parent who is for or supports their child to transition versus the other who does not, um, the decision maker ultimately is the state. Yeah, this is an enormous problem because we and we see it with this bill in California. I mean, here California is proclaiming itself to be a sanctuary for uh, you know the mutilation of children. I mean, that's what they're saying. They're saying if if someone has convinced themselves that they should chemically or physically castrate themselves, and it doesn't matter if they're a, ch- a child, they can come to California, and California will be their guardian, their protector, right? I mean, uh, and so the state will make these determinations. That is going to happen. I mean, that is going to happen unless people stand up and, and put a stop to it. Uh, it's it, the, the flow of law and the flow of policy is very clear on this. 
So back to the uh, midterms, more the meat and potatoes uh, issues. Uh, when it comes to the economy, um, how big of an issue is this going to be when people head to the ballot? I mean, it is interesting to me that uh, conventional wisdom is that it is always about the economy stupid. Um, but it is interesting to me how that hasn't been spoken of <laughs> to the extent you'd normally think in an election. And that's, of course, because the left is dominant, controls uh, much of the media. Uh, so there is a sense in which uh, there's, a, there's a pent up anger, right, uh, that you could see uh, unleashing itself in a, a red wave, regardless of what everyone's saying and regardless of the polling you see now. Uh, so I do, I do think that uh, this is an enormous opportunity for Republicans uh, to, to blame it all on the other side and to almost, uh, almost they should suggest the vote itself is uh, lashing out or, you know, or getting back at uh, the people who did this to you. I think that that's really powerful messaging. The economy affects both, obviously, Republicans and Democrats. Um, in our reporting, we're talking to people who are, you know, getting ready to retire and we're planning and are looking at their 401ks and are having to second guess that. Are you coming across uh, similar situations? Yeah, I see a lot of people throughout the country at both an elite level and just normal level who are increasingly concerned. And it's, not, it's a concern about the economy that goes far beyond just, oh, you know, we're going to take a little haircut here or there. People are getting nervous uh, because they see that these are deep problems, structural problems that aren't getting fixed and that more and more pressure all right, keeps being applied through policy to make the situation worse. Matt Peterson, thank you.